So we'll go ahead. Where we left off. Now watch the other way. Which left? That's two Wednesday. Do you wait until the tape is rolling? Yeah. Why am I on camera? What? Let's do Wednesdays. I don't know. I don't know when. I don't look. It's your job to look. I just accept it when it comes to me, and then I take it. All right. We finished uh, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, with the work energy equation. So we're going to take it from there. Didn't get a, a huge chance to do much with it, so we'll do a little bit more with it today. Um, and also then there's some special cases, just like there were some special constant acceleration type cases that that uh, uh, change some of the some of the way we approach some things. The, the same truth here with the work energy equation. Do you remember what the work energy equation is? Joe doesn't. He gets that look on his face. Uh, uh, work equals. Yeah. Okay. Joe. Joe got the easy part. Joe's got the work part. Change in kinetic energy. If we do some work on something, we might change its speed. We can either speed it up if we're working in the same direction it's already moving anyway, or if we work against the direction it's moving, we can decrease its kinetic energy, slow it down. That's what brakes do. But we can do other things if we do some work on it. What else? Change in... What symbol did I use for potential energy? A U. Some, some folks use a V. Some use a P for potential. Heaven forbid we do something simple and direct like that. Uh, that just means that we can raise or lower something too by, by doing some work on it. And one last piece. Patrick, you want to go for that piece? That's it? That's very disappointing. What did you do over spring break that put you in such a downer mood? Do you want to try again? Change in? Ah, see? Even Len's smiling. Len, Len's I kind of wanted to if you call him. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to you then again sometime later. Thank you. Samantha said, no way I'm smiling at that. All right. Uh, there is a, well, let's go over each of the pieces first, make sure we got those. How do we calculate the work done? What? I heard something. Some. It has to do with with uh, the sum of the forces or the net forces acting on something because each each force could do its own little bit of work. Uh, there might even be forces working against each other. That's what we have to do against friction to get things to move. What else? Times of X. Sort of. Not times. What, Tyler? Uh, the dot product. What does that do for us? Do you remember? We don't actually have to calculate the dot product because there's, there's probably more direct ways to come up with what we need from it. But that does work then for any vectors you've got. And it, it certainly gives us the the uh, result we need to have in here. What's that do for us? That dot product? It makes sure that the amount of force that we're applying, so let's say the uh, resultant force is something simple like that, or it might be that there's only one force, and so by default it's the, the net force that's acting on the object. 
it makes sure that only the component in the same direction that we'd be moving is contributing to the work that we calculate. The other component of that force, in this case the vertical component, is doing no work. It's contributing nothing to the calculation of the work. Doesn't mean it doesn't affect the problem. It most certainly can. For example, this force down would increase the normal force up. And a greater normal force is going to increase the friction force. If the friction force goes up, then this net force is going to change because it's part of the part of the calculation, uh, a part of the contribution to the work. This isn't quite complete. What else? Integral. Integral. That's what this uh, DS business is. So we'll integrate from point one to point two. That's what this subscript here reminds us. And this allows us then to handle the fact that forces can change with position. Um, maybe you push for a little while, you're starting to get tired, your force drops a little bit, buddy comes in to help, force, that force goes up then. Uh, could be you're pushing across two different types of floor, so the friction would change at certain positions. It handles any of those. And in fact, we'll, we'll do a problem with that uh, just after this. For most of our problems, though, that force is constant and then uh, comes out of the integral, and the dot product could probably reduce to something like that uh, for most of the problems. So like most of the, the things we're doing, uh, there, there are some simplifications we can make to keep this stuff moving as we learn our way through it. And then each step as you go through it gets a little bit more complicated as, as you uh, mature through the subject. If you do happen to have a graph of force with position, it could change continuously. That integral then is the area under the force time graph if you happen to have that. And uh, I think we even have a couple problems would do just that. That's the left hand side of the equation. What forces go in here? any and every force in the problem, or just certain forces? Pertinent. Pertinent, I need uh, maybe even a little bit different word. One second, Remember? before you get to moving it from S1 to S2. Of course, but that would be taken care of automatically with that. So I, I, I don't need to say, the, the, well, the thing I'm getting at is there's force involved here. The force of gravity is involved here. But I don't put that calculation in here. In here, we have springs involved in this problem. So they exert forces. But I don't put that calculation in here. What is it about these two forces that means that they don't contribute to this side of the equation? And there was a, a specific word I used to uh, to label those, if you remember. Over here, these are work being done by non-conservative forces. And these two involve conservative forces. How do you tell the difference? How, how do you go home and tell your, your mom and your dad the difference between conservative and non-conservative forces 
when every time you talk to your dad about politics, his eyes bug out and the veins in his neck start and you can't even talk to him about it anymore. Is it like that at all? What's the difference? There's a very easy way to tell the difference between the two as it would mean to you in uh, either applying those forces or, or having to work within some of those forces. Phil, you remember? Well, no, conservatives have vectors. No, all forces are vectors. These, these are, are not, don't have the, quite the vector quality to them because for one, this only acts up and down because that's the direction of the gravitational field. And this acts just merely it has to do with how long the spring is, but it still comes from the forces the springs exert. Joey, you remember? You said something like non conservatives like pushing a box, you have to still have to push it back to get it back there, but like if you raise an object that like gets pushed back down. You that's can't a, get it back. That's exactly it. Uh, non conservative forces. If you turn the problem around and bring it back to the starting place you don't get back to the same place you were with non-conservative forces. In fact, usually things are even worse. If you p push against friction across the floor, you turn around, you want to push back, you double the friction that you've had to work against because you went twice as far now. The friction didn't care which way you were going. It's bad no matter which way you're going. You can't get that kind of force back to where it was. Gravitational force, if something's low, we raise it and then lower it back down, gravity is exactly the same as it was before. There's no change in the earth, there's no change in, in the gravitational pull, there's nothing different. Same with springs. If we stretch them out a certain distance in a problem, let them stretch back to their original length, they're exactly the same as they were before for all our intents and purposes. These things we can recover. These things are conserved. These things are non-conservative. No matter what we do, we lose what we do there. And it gets even worse if we try to get back you. So that's the difference there. Uh, be careful, don't count the weight over here. The weight's being counted for over there. Delta K. Give it to me real quick. Patrick, remember? Remember K? Of course, it's change in whatever we've got there. So it's K2 minus K1. Remember the Ks? I bet you remember, you'll remember when we say them. What's, what's kinetic energy? One half? Anybody? One half M. V squared. v squared. So this is one half mv2 minus one half mv1 squared. Be careful. Students very commonly don't write that out. And if v2 happens to be zero, if it's a problem where we bring the object to a stop, if v2 happens to be zero, you've got to make sure this minus sign is still there. So be careful with this. Students a lot of times just write one half mv squared because one or the other of them is zero and they lose that minus sign. So be careful with that. Um, delta u g. Change in gravitational potential energy. Remember the form of that one? Uh, almost. Mg delta H. It's kind of like vectors. If you have vectors in one place and not on the other, then they can't be equal. This is the same thing with these delta signs. We have something changing here. We have to have a change here. Students very often leave off that H. Doesn't lead to the kind of prop or leave off the delta. Uh, doesn't lead to the same kind of problems it does in the other one necessarily. But leave it in because it is a change in the height that's important, not the height itself. How do we find delta UE?
change in, of course, and either of those or even both could be zero. Certainly zero if we didn't have a string in the problem. Remember how to find that? Has a K in it because that, that tells us how strong this string is. Has to do with that too. One half. K times del. Yeah, one half K. Del two squared minus del one squared. And what was that definition of del? The book uses X. A lot of books do. I don't like to use X there because that X could be different than the x used for position in the problem as a whole. Remember what was the definition of that del term I put there? The, the change in length of the spring from its equilibrium length, from its rest length, the very length it had when you took it out of the box. Notice it doesn't care what angle the spring is pointing. It doesn't matter if it's pointing diagonally or not. It just matters whether or not it's been stretched or compressed. Either one of those situations can make del non-zero. All these terms are either equal or added together so they all have to have the, have the same units. Remember what the units were in the SI system for this equation for each one of these terms individually? Newton meters. Most easily seen from this work term because that's force times distance. But each of the other ones, and it's not as easy to see them, but we did work through it, each of the other ones are also going to have units of Newton meters. It's a good chance in these problems when you're working on the individual pieces here to check the units and the minus signs to make sure that they make sense in the problem. Another name for a Newton meter? Joule. Just so you recognize it. Capital J. Though if you don't put that, I'm not going to take off because I usually stop at the different meters myself. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do, let's, I told you there were a couple special classes. They don't really change how you work with the equation, um, but it is a different situation in terms of, of uh, really what's going on. So we'll take a problem here that we've done before, and we'll do it with the work energy equation. So imagine we've got a 3.5 kilogram ball. Given some initial velocity, Upward, whether it just bounced off of the table and is now starting on its way back up, or whether it's been thrown or shot or something, I don't care, that doesn't matter to it. Rises to a height of 120 meters. Using the work energy equation, find out what V1 is. All right, we're kind of warming up from uh, coming back from spring break, so let's, let's do this one together because there's a couple things in here we need to know about. So the work energy equation. All four parts of it. 
first thing you do after you've written it down is go and look at those four parts and see if there's any ones of them you can get rid of. If you can, the problem's already getting smaller and smaller. Smaller problems are easier to do than big problems. Any of these problems, zero. Is work, the work term, zero? It either is or it isn't. It's as simple as that. However, it's not subject to a democratic vote. But it either is or it isn't. <coughs> Doesn't mean we can't vote to see what the opinions are. But I heard somebody say, no, it's not zero. Anybody say, yes, it is zero. Remember, this is work done by, by what? Non-conservative forces. Those forces where somebody reaches in, pushes, pulls, certainly where there's friction. So if the work term is not zero, that means there are forces you can tell me about that are doing work. <coughs> what are they? Come on, you guys who said, yeah, the work term, no, the work term is not zero. Okay. Tell me what the forces are. Gravity. Wait. Why isn't gravity? Because it's a conservative force. Gravity is a conservative force. We take care of it over here. We don't want to count for it twice. Yeah. We only want to count for it once. So what forces are there doing non-conservative work? No wind resistance. Ha ah, there will be tomorrow in lab when we do realistic free <coughs> fall. Kinetic force? Want to take that back? <laughs> Remember, all forces in these problems that we do in this class are caused by something you can point to, I can go and touch, I can see it, I can't see kinetic. So there can't be such a thing as kinetic forces. There are no non-conservative forces in this problem. So that term is zero. Our problem's already 25% smaller. Is there a change in speed? I had uh, no, I had some yeses. Yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. It, it starts with some speed. In fact, we need to find that. What's the speed here? Yeah, that's how we know it got up to 120 meters. When it gets up to there, it stops. That's what marks the, uh, the 120 meter. We need it to get up to there. I didn't want it to go farther. I didn't want it to go less. So not only is this not zero, do we know if it's negative or positive? Sorry? It's, it's, it's very straightforward to look at. If the kinetic energy increases, this will be positive. The only way the kinetic, ener kinetic energy can increase is if the object speeds up or slows down? Speeds up. Is it speeding up? It's slowing down. It's got good kick of speed here. Doesn't have any speed here. So we know that this is going to be then negative. So we know that already. We know it's not zero. We also know it's going to be negative. So we can check this as we go along so we don't screw it up. We lose the negative signs. We lose the squares. Or we lose the units, things are going to square, or screw up because we're going to be doing a different problem. Why is it negative? Because it's got kinetic energy at the start, it has none at the finish because it actually comes to a stop up here at the 20 meters, 120 meters. I said I wanted to get up to here. I don't want it to go farther, I don't want it to go less. I need to go right there. We know that's going to be there because that's where it comes to a stop. And then it starts to fall back down. But we didn't ask about that. Um, 
is this zero. Anytime there's a change in height in a gravitational field, that's not zero. And of course, there is no, there is a change in height. Is that positive or negative? Positive. If it gets higher, it gets more potential energy, and that goes up. So we know that one's positive. Non-zero, and we know it's positive. So uh, as we're we haven't even done a whole lot yet, and the problem is just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. There's, there's hardly anything to do. Is this zero? How come? There's no spring in the problem. The problem's half the size it was when we started, even less because we already got that minus sign and plus sign business. This is a special situation. It doesn't really affect it in terms of what we do, but it is a special situation in terms of what the physics is going on. In the absence of outside forces, by, uh, by outside, I mean nobody's reaching in to give a push or a pull. There's no dragging friction going on. I don't mean there's no weight, because we're taking care of that over there. So it doesn't even matter if there's gravitational pull or not. We take care of that elsewhere. In the absence of, no, of outside forces, that work term is zero, like it is in this example, then that side, well, is also zero, because they're equal. If this is zero, then that's all zero. This is known as the conservation of energy. Whatever energy, oops, conservation of, whatever energy we started the problem with, we finished with. No more energy comes into or out of the problem. In fact, it tells you that only outside forces can bring energy in to a problem or can take energy out of a problem. All that's going to happen here is energy is going to go from one of these to the other. But the total amount of energy is going to stay the same. The change in energy itself, the total, we're talking about mechanical energy. I'm not including thermal energy. I'm not including chemical energy or nuclear energy or SpaghettiOs. Nobody here. Nobody, oh yeah, Alan has a mustache. So whatever energy he stores in his mustache from lunch, that's all there. Whatever energy we start the problem with, we finish with. The only way energy gets in or out of a problem, our problems, is by the application of force of some kind. Did you just get back last night, Mike? No. Been back for a while? Yeah. Just haven't been sleeping for a while, have you? you go over in the lab and take a nap there. You're driving Phil nuts. He's just afraid your head's going to drop back and you're going to knock him out. All right, so we happen to have a problem where energy is conserved because there's no non-conservative forces in this problem. However, in terms of what we do with it, eh, nothing's any different. So, let's look at these term by term. That way we can make sure the units are right, make sure the minus signs are still right. One half m v2 squared minus v1 squared. Any part of that zero? Yeah, V2 is zero. That's, that's the deal up here. When it reaches that point, it has no speed. That's zero. And in fact, there's the minus sign we need. Because every other term is positive. That's the only place our minus sign is coming from. We, we don't want to introduce it artificially, but we do want to make sure it's there. And right there's our minus sign. So we can put in the terms we know. We're looking for V1, and I'll bring the minus sign out in the front there now. 
And that's how we're going to find the V1 right there. Uh, that, that's what we were asked to find. What are the units on that? Are they? V1 or on K. Delta K. <coughs> what are the units on Delta K? Maybe. What must the new units on V1 be for that term to be newton meters or joules? If V1 is in meters per second, this will be in newton meters. If V1 is in anything else, that wouldn't be newton meters. And uh, we want newton meters on each of the terms. Well, it doesn't have to be newton meters, but it does have to be the same thing on each of the terms. What's 3.5 divided by uh, divided by 2? 1.75. There, see that? That was a small little problem to do, so it was it was pretty pretty easy to keep from screwing it up. The only other term we have in the problem is delta U G. That's MGH, sorry, MG delta H. Let's see, M was uh, 3.5, got it right there. G, what do we put in for G? Nope. 9.81 meters per second squared. However, G is acting down. What do you mean it doesn't matter? G is always acting down. That's where the Earth is. G is down. See? That's a picture right there of the Earth. What? G is always positive. Have I said that before? Now you're remembering finally? Nobody wants to stumble in for that one and have a negative in here? Nobody? Tyler? You volunteer? Not for that one? Volunteer for something exciting? What's delta H? Uh, positive? Yeah, because it's going up. It's going higher. Its height is increasing. Are the units there okay? Yeah. Yep, Newton meters. So that's going to be okay. Uh, who's got that number for me? 4120. 4120. Now we can put it all back together. We had zero on the left hand side. Minus 1.75 V1 squared. We know that V has got to be in meters per second. That's the only way all this is going to work out. We've already checked it. Plus 41.20. All that Newton meters. Boy, that's an easy problem to solve. See how small the problem got? What's V1? 48.5 meters per second. All right. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Something's wrong. What is it, Mike? Oh, I thought we said down was positive. No, down's not positive. Well, down, down's down, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. 
So that's positive because we're going against the gravitational field. So it doesn't matter what we call up or down, that's against the gravitational field. So it's greater in height. That's got to be, uh, uh, that's considered automatically a, a plus then. Why is this zero? What, what could go in here in a problem like this? If this was a real problem that we were doing over in the lab, assuming the lab was 120 meters high, if this was a real problem what we were doing, would this term really be zero? What would be in there? Okay, I said, and I, somebody asked that. He even said, do are we neglecting air resistance? And I said, yeah, we are. So this is really a free fall problem, isn't it? Remember doing free fall problems about a month and a half ago we started them, I think? Remember? Back when you were physics students this high? How come? Mass did not matter. I haven't even mentioned mass yet in class when we did free fall problems. Now mass matters. Why is that? How can we do free fall problems where mass matters now when before we were doing free fall problems and mass didn't matter? Do we need to go back and start the term over from the beginning because everything's been wrong? What did we do? We're concerned with energy. Huh? That's we're concerned with energy now. It's still the same problem, though. It's still, it's still a free fall problem where mass didn't matter. I've never even mentioned mass by the time we did free fall problems. Technically, mass doesn't matter. Right? UG or delta UG equals delta K. So what did you say, Phil? Must have already got final velocity. What do you mean? Yeah, we've already got final velocity at zero. That doesn't mean this isn't a free fall problem. Alan had it. Yeah, well, let's let instead of putting the numbers in, let's just use the equations. Work equals zero. Change of kinetic energy was one half m. V2 squared minus V1 squared. Don't even have to put any numbers in yet. Plus mg delta H plus zero. So that's that's our work energy equation, isn't it? <coughs> what happens if we divide through by mass? Divide through by M. Just a scale. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what the mass is. So this is still truly a free fall problem where mass doesn't matter. But if we were doing this as a as a rocket ship problem or something, when maybe we're neglecting air resistance, but we're having mass lost because fuel's being burned and spewed out the back, we could still handle it. We could still handle the fact that there was no air resistance, but we could handle the fact the mass was itself was changing. It'd be a more complicated problem, but we could do it. But it still is a free fall problem. Mass still doesn't matter. It's just we didn't see that in here because we had the mass in and then it actually would uh, would divide out as we did the problem. I guess when you when you solve for B1 here, you don't see it, but the mass divides out. And you can do that again as one of our free fall problems and get exactly that same answer. Okay. That was just a warm up. That was just a warm up because it was a pretty straightforward problem. Got our first look at conservation of energy. But it doesn't really change the problem. We still, we still calculate it the same way. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll do another look at the uh, conservation of energy in a little bit here. Let's see. Wow. 
let's do let's do this. And this, and this, and this. Now I'm trying to decide, do I want to make it hard yeah. or easy? What is it? You want hard? Hard. Yeah? Well, they're all easy. You know, I let it be easy. This, oh, that's simple. Oh, that's simple. Oh, that's simple. All right, well, maybe I'll, I'll even, oh, it's a big stretch here. Get out of, uh, get out of class question already. If it's hard enough. All right, here's your, here's your problem. Up a 13 degree slope. Your job is to push this crate. I'm being generous, but I'm going to say that you can push with 42 newtons. Malcolm could do more than 42, hey Lynn? But you guys are limited to 42. <coughs> All right. Um, initial velocity. Three meters per second. So it's already moving when we come upon the problem here. Sometime later, up here, it's now moving two meters per second. Notice I labeled that point three. I call that V3 because there's something going on in between. At a point eight meters from the fence from the start. is seven meters from the finish. <coughs> At a point there, the, uh, the surface changes to a much rougher surface. of friction down here, a nice slippery 0.12. Uh, would that be kinetic or static? Kinetic, because the box is moving over the surface of the hillside there. Friction up here is 0.36. Let's see if I have all the pieces there. I think I do. You have to find M. If the box is more massive than that, then it won't even be going this two meters per second up here. If it's less massive than that, it'll be going over that two meters per second. So we need it to arrive up there at the top with two meters per second speed to it. That's your get out of class question. Now, 
work energy equation will work real nice with this because it's a position dependent problem. If I were you, I'd work the little pieces of the work energy equation one at a time, especially since that makes it easier for me to help you know if one of them went wrong. If you put them all together in one equation, you can do it, but it's going to be hard for me to look at it and say which part went wrong. Because usually what happens is you make one mistake, not, not many. Now, if, if you want to, just for reference, if you think you need to, I call it this point one, that point three, this point in the middle, we can call point two if you want. The numbers don't matter, they're just arbitrary. As long as you're doing the deltas between the right points at the right time, you're okay. free to talk to each other if you want see if you need to, to put your heads together because uh, you know what we say if you want to graduate heads makes about half of a real one Stuck, need a little help or advice? Yeah. 
and more things circled. John's busy with something. consulting rate because it is class time. 50 bucks an hour. Tyler doing okay? Yes. yes. Phil? Yeah? Doing okay? me first because I charge 50 bucks an hour he's free or if he isn't you're a fool so just be fun. <laughs> you chose to be zero this one I gotta ignore this thing what's that you guys want to be zero is that going on yeah is there a secret spring somewhere well yeah there is but not this problem Secret spring is where they keep it out in the water.
You don't have to do it that way, Samantha, if you don't want to. There's, there's probably another way. Yeah, that's kind of what some people like about the work energy equation. Others hate is it's very flexible. There's many different ways you can can do all these little parts to it. Let's see. Uh, guess we'll put work one to three, right? Because we're starting at point one and we're finishing at point three. What do we do about this friction change in between? No, you don't forget about it. Yeah, friction is going to be negative work. Here's part of the magic, I think, or not the, the magic, but the flexibility of the work energy equation. If you have different things going on, if you have different things doing different things in the problem, you can just do each one of them separately and add them up. To find the work done from point one to point three, calculate the work done from one to two, add that to the work done from two to three. This happens to have one friction. This happens to have the uh, another friction. But within those, everything's constant. So you can do the sum of the forces from 1 to 2, delta x, 1 to 2. Nothing changes in there, so the integral uh, of f dot ds becomes that. And then recalculate the friction and just redo it for the different section. Delta x for the first part happens to be 8. Delta x for the second part happens to be 7. Only thing that changes between the two is the friction force. And then just add them together. No, 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 that's just this side. Then you do the other side. Remember I said do these pieces okay. separately, one at a time. This one, well, that's just the whole change from one to three. You don't care about two in between because that, that isn't affected at point two. Nothing changes at point two. And here, uh, it's just the two velocities, which you have to get. You don't even care what speed it's moving at point two here. Just skip it. So only the work term has any change at two. The others are unaffected by point two. So just ignore point two. these are functions of M, as are both of those. And then you just factor that at the end. Yep. You just solve for it. You'll have one equation, one unknown. The only unknown will be M. Is that how you were doing it, Alan? Or just sort of? Sort of. Another way you can do it is, you know the velocity here, you can figure out what the velocity is here. And then take this velocity here, and you know what it is here, do it as two separate problems where you figure out the intermediate velocity. You can do it that way if you want to. You should get the same answer either way. And either one is correct. Like I said, some students love that flexibility. Some students just say, just tell me which way to do it and I'll do it. Okay, Phil, you thinking?
us a little bit. Okay. Samantha, you don't want help. Are you helpless? Oh yeah, you'll need the normal force because that determines the friction. Joey, get the normal force. Well, you don't know the mass, so the normal force is going to depend on m, which means the friction force depends on m, which means these two terms are going to depend on m. You're going to have an m in there, an unknown m, because that's what you're trying to find. You're trying to find this m. But these two terms will have an M in there too, and in the end you'll have one equation and one unknown. It's the one equation with M as the only unknown. What velocity is it? The uh, a four term equation with M in each term. What can I help you with, Samantha? The normal force? Okay. Remember what I said was the very best way to find the normal force? Free body diagram. Got to have a free body diagram to find the normal force. So there's our thing on a, on a 13 degree slope. Any forces on it? Yeah, we got this this 42 newtons here that's straight up the slope and friction because it's dragging along the slope. What else? Gravity, which acts straight down. We don't know what that is because we don't know what M is, but we're trying to find that. What else? Well, the normal force you're looking for is the other thing. And remember, it's perpendicular to the surface. Trying to find that force. Now, you don't have to. It might help, though, if you call that the x direction and that the y direction. Generally, if you line up your coordinate system with the thing you're looking for, it just is a little bit simpler that way. That n is a y direction force, so let's sum the forces in the y direction. What should the y direction forces sum to? Zero, because it's not accelerating in the y direction. It is in the x direction, but not the y direction. So that means all the up forces equal all the down ones. N is up. In the y direction, W, we've got this little piece of W over here. W in the y direction, and then W in the x direction. You see it okay? Drawing didn't get too crowded. Okay. So uh, n up has got to equal W y down. Those are only two ones in the y direction. Wy is W. That's the same angle as the as the slope. Negative. What's negative? Oh, when you find the friction. Haven't found it yet. Oh. 
She was asking about the normal force. Now, we don't know what M is, but we know what everything else is. We know G, we know cosine 13. Now, we use that to find then the friction force, which is mu k times n. n is that. And so there's the friction force. And when you get to this second section, all that changes is mu k. Nothing else changes. So you can set that up for the two sections. Each one goes in there. We push with one, we pull with the friction. So we have two different uh, frictions. You can call them A and B if you want, or one and two, two and three. Phil. I was just hoping you could get What? You're done? All right. I oh, just want to check an intermediate result. What part? Hopefully I have the same number to check. What's what's that mean? Oh, why well, not just a little F? Okay, but it's got M in it. And so that's what that is. No, that's meters. Yes. That's okay. What's the 1.8 meters? That's oh, that's change. delta UG. Okay. I thought this was your work thing. Okay. All right. And you, you can add those together because that's the total work done from 1 to 3. And then that that total will equal this. Yeah, which still has n in it. Then what else? That's the one we're going to apply to. Oh, okay. All right. So it's the total work is that minus the work done by this, which would be this times that 8 meters, and this time the 7 meters. I'm just confused how to settle on what I got all the other things. Yeah, I know. Well you, 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 well, you got this part, and then you went on to another part, and then you went back to a part of the first part, but you hadn't done that first part in the first part. So you got all the part, well, almost all the parts. You don't have delta K. Um, you got almost all the parts, but you're kind of scattering them around. So let's Let's look at that work term. Just the work term. One way to do it. Um, let's see. Uh, you can just start putting pieces in. We're pushing with 42. But we're working against friction with the first coefficient of friction in here. So that's uh, minus, because we're working against friction. M, which we don't know. G, which is 9.81. Mu K, which is 0.12. I got M, G, U, K, cosine 13. All of that, all that is, is simply the friction force in the first section. Because we're using the lower coefficient of friction. This together all 
is the sum of the forces for that first section. This force continues all the way through, but this friction only applies for the first section. And then that sum of the forces times the length of that first section, eight meters. Maybe because we got a couple M's in here, we'll wanna just change the shape of them. We'll make that a capital M. Just to keep from making a mistake. That's just the work done for the first section. Tyler, is that a hand up? Yeah, what about the WX? I got to include that. WX. This part? Yeah. That's also work in the native direction. Um, no, because that's a, a conservative force. That's taken care of, uh, I don't have it up here, in the gravitational part. Remember, gravitation, you don't want to count for it twice. It's real easy to do. This is just the non-conservative forces. Now, that's just the first section there, the one-two section. The two-three section looks exactly the same. 42 minus M. I don't even need the units because I already worked them out. But the friction changes, the coefficient changes from 2 to 0.36. Cosine 13 and now only 7 meters. Oops, that's 7 meters times the force. What, Bill? Um, Did you want me to do that for you? Oh, no, I just saw what I was using. And yes, M is an unknown in here, but this comes down to be uh, two numbers. When you add all those together, collect like terms, you just have two little numbers left over. And in fact, I think I even have them here. Once you collect all these, it becomes nothing more than 630 minus 17.2 M. And that's all going to be in Newton meters because we checked all the units. So that whole friction, the work done by the friction part and you pushing, comes out to be a very simple little number when you work through the steps. Assuming those numbers are right. Sorry? I, uh... See, this 630 is 42 times 8 plus 42 times 7. Or, I guess, 42 times 15. That's positive. That's the work you're doing in the same direction as the objects moving. This minus 17.2 M is the friction work that you're losing. Samantha, where are you stuck now? And you're there too. You don't know where that is, but you're there together. Joey? Well, we've done a problem like this where we have friction on a slope. The only thing is we have two different slopes that we just have to add together. You wish it was 
still spring break. In your head, it is. Tyler, did that help some? Samantha, where are you stuck still? So let me help. Do you put gravity in? Huh? I didn't put gravity in until Yeah, you don't put this WX in. However, this we're not putting gravity in. This is the normal force. That plus that are all the normal force right. times the friction coefficient, which is the friction force. I just, I F was new in. Yeah, well, yeah, if you want to do it later, that's fine. That's but if you put in all the numbers you know, you should get down to just this simple little form for that entire thing. That's the whole work term all the way from 1 to 3. If you put all the numbers in, it becomes pretty simple. I know getting there may not be as simple, but once you get through it, <coughs> that, I mean, that's why we're doing it, is to try to simplify the little pieces as we go. I didn't No, 42 was given. Nicely. Good. No, we're, we're moving in that direction and the force is pointed in that direction. So this is F dot DX already. That force times those distances is all done. Since they're all lined up. Yeah, you can you can do a different x and y for different parts of the problem if it will help. Because remember, the coordinates are man-made; they're arbitrary. They're not; the, they don't affect the physics. They affect the solution. Yeah. All right. Well, work on it a little bit. We'll see what you have um, on Wednesday. Huh? Is it? No. 13? No. No. It's not what I got. 13.1. No. Not even close. Oh, wait. There's a decimal in there, but it's still not 13. I got 40.6.